American Indian people have long been here in Garden of the Gods at the base of Pikes Peak. They came for many different reasons. Among them was that it was an ecological crossroads where there was an abundance of wildlife and plant life that occurred in this one location, whereas in other locations they'd have to go for miles and miles to find so many things in one place. And that then made it a cultural crossroads for American Indian nations who came here for that reason, as well as the bubbling springs of Manitou. The Indians out in western Kansas got on the warpath, and the government sent Colonel Sumner of the regular army to this country to chastise these Indians, which he did in good shape. Now at this time I was keeping a meat market down in the town of Lawrence, Kansas. On the north side of the Kansas River was the Delaware Indian Reservation. The tribesmen were there, and I used to buy cattle from them. There was one of these Indians that I bought cattle from by the name of Fall Leaf. Now this man was with Colonel Sumner's expedition during the summer of 1857, acting as a guide. Late in the year when Fall Leaf returned, he came over to Lawrence and showed me quite a bunch of gold nuggets tied up in a rag. I said, Fall Leaf, where did you get these? He said he got these on the Sumner expedition. He said he came to a little stream of water that was running out of the side of a mountain, got off his horse to get a drink. He saw the nuggets lying on the rocks as the water ran over them, and he just picked them up, of course. John Easter Well, Manifest Destiny was a phrase that was coined by a newspaper editor, and the idea was that the United States was destined by God to expand its borders uh, all across the continent, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Um, it was a very popular idea when it was coined in the 1840s, and uh, it is one of the reasons for the outbreak of the U.S.-Mexican War of 1846. Um, and you can imagine how the Republic of Mexico felt about this idea that was being spouted off in the United States that we're destined to expand even though there's another country already in place in these western territories. People were willing to uh, use this justification that it's God's will so we can trample uh, Mexico's rights and we can trample American Indians' rights because that whole area was populated by American Indians as well. But that didn't stop happening what did happen. And the Mexican-American War brought the United States, what is today the American Southwest, and opened the door for uh, eventually the rush to Colorado in 1859. Fall Leaf claimed he'd found the gold about two days' travel from Pike's Peak. On being asked if he could find that place again, he replied that he could. Easter proposed to pay him five dollars per day if he could go out with a party of men and show them where he found it. He agreed to go, and on the strength of that agreement, a party was formed to go out to the mountains and hunt for gold. After a party had been raised, the Indian chief said we must get him provisions for his family to last them six months. We found that we could raise a company of about 33 men with 12 wagons, 10 ox teams, and one mule team. John D. Miller Well, the Panic of 1857 uh, created a lot of hardships, especially in the American Midwest. Um, there's one figure that, due to the panic, 5,000 businesses failed. Um, many people were out of work. Uh, the value of U.S. currency plummeted. Uh, stocks plummeted. Uh, but for the, the common folk, all they knew was they were losing their jobs. Uh, people that had stores uh, did not have customers. Consequently, they had to default um, on payments. Uh, before the panic, it was real easy to get credit and uh, people were using credit to acquire furniture, you know, belongings, and all of a sudden the credit's no longer there, the currency's not worth anything. Um, it sets them up in a position where they're willing to take a chance on something or a hope of recovering their former prosperity. And for many people, that hope of recovery lies to the west, to Pikes Peak. Twenty-seven May, 1858. 
the party of gold seekers set out from Lawrence, Kansas on a 43-day journey to Pikes Peak. The route was to Council Grove along the Santa Fe Trail, where other members from the region were soon to join in, then west to Bent's Ford, continuing on the Cherokee Trail to the Pikes Peak region. John Easter's wagon laid back to wait for their Indian guide. After providing six months of provisions for Fall Leaf's family, the Indian guide refused to go along and unveil the source of his gold. After talking the matter over and having our teams and supplies bought for six months, we all decided to go on and do the best we could under the circumstances. J. H. Turney, one of our oldest men, had been to California, having crossed the plains in 1849, so we elected him captain of our company. John D. Miller Left the coal bank May 31. Started on foot, overtook the train at Bluff Creek. Walked 35 miles. June 1. Left camp with 10 wagons. Drove to Council Grove 15 miles. Found some very fine streams today, but little timber and fine prairie. Council Grove is built in a mud hole, but 10 or 15 houses. Saw two buffalo calves today. Augustus Voorhees. We were told on leaving Council Grove, the border town of Kansas, that beyond that point, any Indians we might meet would be hostile and we'd probably have to fight them. The boys had no fear of Indians. We were well armed and most of us had experience in the use of firearms during the Bleeding Kansas War. Jason T. Yonker. June 5. Remained in camp. Captain Holmes came in today. We now have nine ox teams, two horse teams, and one mule team. Fifty head of cattle, forty-six men, two women, one child, and eight loose horses. Augustus Voorhees. James Holmes comes from New York, and he's a free stater. And he joins uh, John Brown, who is not only an abolitionist, but he's an abolitionist that um, advocates violence to bring about a free territory and the abolition of slavery. So uh, you have these two people uh, who meet um, near Lawrence and eventually uh, become married, uh, but they're here in Kansas because of abolition and because of their very uh, strong beliefs that um, there shall not be slavery in these new territories. There shall not be slavery at all. Well, Julie Archibald Holmes writes that um, their reasons for traveling to Colorado on this quest for, for finding gold really wasn't that much about uh, discovering the mineral or becoming wealthy. A lot of it was about adventure. And I, I think if you look at these personalities, James Holmes, Julia Archibald Holmes' wife, they're intellectuals, um, they're enlightened, and there's an unexplored territory to the west, um, you know, the Great Plains, the Front Range of the Rocky Mountains. And, and uh, Holmes had, had, by that time, uh, left behind, you know, there, there wasn't the fighting going on between the pro-slavery men and the Free Staters. He'd established a business, um, but they heard about this Lawrence party that was going to go out and seek gold along the Front Range, and here was an opportunity to expand their knowledge and uh, their world. Uh, it was exciting uh, to go into this untrammeled country and, and to see, you know, this amazing wonder like Pikes Peak. Sister Slayer, I think an account of my recent trip will be received with some interest by my sisters in reform, the readers of the Sibyl, if not by the rest of mankind, since I am, perhaps, the first woman who has worn the American costume across the Prairie Sea, which divides the great frontier of the states from the Rocky Mountains. Animated more by a desire to cross the plains and behold the great mountain chain of North America than by any expectation of realizing the floating gold stories, we hastily laid a supply of provisions in the covered wagon, and two days thereafter, the 2nd of June, we were on the road to join the Lawrence party. Julia Archibald Holmes We reached the Cottonwood Creek Crossing the 5th of June, where we found the train encamped. We were now fairly launched on the waving prairie. 
a person who has beheld neither the ocean nor the great silent uninhabited plains will find it impossible to form any adequate idea of the grandeur of the scene with the blue sky overhead the endless variety of flowers underfoot it seemed that the ocean's solitude had united with all the landscape beauties in such a scene there is a charm for some minds which is impossible for me to describe but it made my heart leap for joy julia archibald holmes at the big bend of the arkansas we encountered a band of indians who were gathered there waiting for their annuities from the united states government they made no hostile demonstrations and we passed on at cow creek a branch of the arkansas we saw a herd of buffalo that were all one day passing a solid moving mass and we heard the trampling of them nearly all the night following. My impression was there must have been millions in numbers. Frank M. Cobb Before we reached Walnut Creek, we were told that a large body of Arapaho, Cheyenne, Kiowa, and Comanche, said to be about 8,000 of them, camped near Pawnee Fork. When we arrived in the vicinity of their camp, they gathered around us in want of flour, sugar, coffee, tobacco, and whiskey. They troubled us so much that Captain Turney told us we had better corral and pay our toll. That the Indians levied tribute on all people passing through their country, and if we did not pay it, they would be likely to stampede our stock, as they considered we were trespassing on their ground and would kill their buffalo although we had not killed any up until that time. When we corralled, he got the chiefs of the four principal tribes together, had them sit on the ground, light their pipes, and smoke the pipe of peace. Then they spread their blankets on the ground, and we brought out flour, sugar, coffee, and tobacco, and gave each chief some. The chiefs then issued their orders to their young braves, when they immediately left us and returned to camp. We bid the chiefs goodbye and pulled out for the West. John D. Miller I was much pleased to learn on my arrival that the company contained a lady and rejoiced at the prospect of having a female companion on such a long journey. But my hopes were disappointed. I soon found that there could be no congeniality between us. After we had become somewhat acquainted, she in great kindness gave me her advice. If you have a long dress with you, do put it on for the rest of the trip. The men talk so much about you. I cannot afford to dress to please their taste, I replied. I could not positively enjoy a moment's happiness with long skirts on to confine me to the wagon. I then endeavored to explain to her the many advantages which the reform dress possesses over the fashionable one, but failed to make her appreciate my views. Julia Archibald Holmes 15 June. The Lawrence party reached the Pawnee Fork along the Santa Fe Trail. The dry route was chosen, and the party decided to travel this 50-mile segment over the course of one overnight, followed by a second late night. The moon was a waxing crescent, four nights after a new moon. We now had a stretch of land to pass over, of 40 or 50 miles, on which there was ordinarily no water, no wood, nor any good grass. We started an hour or so before sundown, and traveled until midnight without resting. Here we halted a half hour, and made some coffee over a fire made of wood we had brought from camp the day before. Resuming our journey, we continued traveling until after sunrise in the morning, when we arrived at Coon Creek, which we were glad enough to find was not dry as it generally is. Julia Archibald Holmes We spent our evenings visiting each other's tents, jollying each other telling stories, playing cards, and singing old-fashioned songs such as Nellie Gray, My Old Kentucky Home, Ring Ring the Banjo, and many others. We fancied we had a star quartet of singers and all would join in the chorus. 
The Wolves often try to rival our concerts. Jason T. Yonker As the train passed the Arkansas crossing, James and I went to the river to see some Santa Fe wagons cross. The river here, perhaps a mile wide, and the bottom one broad bed of sand, with here and there a channel nearly as deep as the cattle's backs. After unloading a part of their freight and placing perishable articles above where the water would enter the wagons, they attached twelve or more yoke of cattle and entered the swift running river. It was indeed an amusing scene. Twenty Mexicans with sharp sticks, punching the cattle, shouting and tumbling in the water. The leading cattle continually endeavoring to turn back. The wagon master on horseback, swearing in Mexican, now at the cattle, then at the men, creating a wonderful confusion. Julia Archibald Holmes June 23. Drove 18 miles. Camped on the river, still no timber. I found a small spring in a ravine of clear water. We got one antelope today. It is fine eating. The country is getting rough. Augustus Voorhees. On the 28th, we reached Bent's Fort, a large structure built by a Mr. Bent for the purpose of trading with the Prairie Indians, the Cheyennes in particular. The price paid for a buffalo robe at present is 10 cups of sugar, about 8 pounds. Julia Archibald Holmes The fort is built on a bluff near the river, built of sandstone 100 feet wide and 200 long, 13 rooms with a large yard inside. The walls are 16 feet high, the rooms are covered with timber and gravel, a breastwork around the top with portholes for a cannon of which they have two pieces. The river is very rapid at this place. Augustus Voorhees On arriving at Bent's Fort on the Arkansas River, we found no soldiers but an Indian trader in possession of the fort. Some of our boys made an inquiry and found the trader had whiskey. We afterwards called it Taos Lightning. After sampling a few pints of the beverage, the boys swore it would kill at 600 yards. We afterward learned the stuff was made by Mexicans at Taos from wheat tramped out by sheep on a dirt floor and that the wheat and sheep dirt were ground and distilled together to make an extraordinary decoction. Jason T. Yonker Up until this time, our company had been remarkably healthy. This afternoon, however, several were taken very ill. Among the sufferers, some of the quasi-moralists who so opposed my mode of dress and women's freedom. One of the actors in this disgraceful occurrence, the one-fourth of which I have not described, an eminent attorney, has since returned to eastern Kansas and written a long letter on the trip in which he stigmatizes strong-minded women and weak-minded men, and greatly fears for the morality of the world on their account. But of such stuff are generally the croakers against reform everywhere. Julia Archibald Holmes June 29. Drove 20 miles. Camped on the river. Got an antelope today. Got a glimpse of Spanish peaks in New Mexico. It is a peak of the Raton Mountains. It looks like a thundercloud. Augustus Voorhees We began to look anxiously for a glimpse of Pike's Peak. On the evening of July 3rd, after camping, a sudden rain and hailstorm came upon us, penetrating more or less every wagon cover and blowing down most of the tents. The next morning, we bid farewell to the Arkansas River, whose company we had kept 300 miles. Traveling but 15 miles, the train camped early this evening in order to celebrate the glorious Fourth. This was done by consuming what little whiskey remained among the members. This day we obtained 
the first view of the summit of the peak, now some seventy miles away. As all expected to find precious treasure near this wonderful peak, it is not strange that our eyes were often strained by gazing on it. The summit appeared majestic in the distance, crowned with glistening white. Julia Archibald Holmes. Yeah, Pike's Peak or Bust, you have to go back to um, what people knew about the Great American Desert, the American West, the Plains. And Pike's Peak, because of uh, the journals that were published of Zebulon Pike and especially John C. Fremont, Fremont used the term Pike's Peak to refer to that, that big mountain that, that shadows Colorado Springs today. Uh, that was a very well-known landmark. So people knew Pike's Peak, and that was a sort of destination, a beacon for these people that were rushing west once gold was discovered. And of course, uh, if you didn't make Pike's Peak, you went bust. So the phrase that often was a rallying cry of these uh, gold seekers was Pike's Peak or bust. I'm going to get there, or I'm going to bust. I'm going to be broken. We were passing over an uneven road today and getting a mile or two in advance of the wagons. We came upon a pair of antelope grazing. Immediately dropping on the ground that we might not frighten them, we had a fine opportunity to examine their beautiful form and motion. They advanced toward us until they were scarcely ten rods off with eyes riveted upon us, perhaps a minute, when sudden as lightning, they started and bounded away as like the wind. Their smooth form with slender, tapering legs, glossy hair, large eyes, their graceful and intelligent motion left a deep impression of their beauty. Proceeding up the Boiling Springs River, we arrived on July 8th as near as wagons could approach the mountains. Julia Archibald Holmes Well, the Ute, of course, knew this mountain as Sun Mountain because it was the mountain that collected the sun's rays in the first morning light. And they made this their home also because it was a landmark. These rocks were a beacon for travelers of all types for centuries and centuries and centuries, even up to and including the time that uh, the gold seekers came here. Nine July. Three men from the Lawrence Party, Frank M. Cobb, John D. Miller, and Augustus Voorhees began an ascent of Pikes Peak and reached the summit on 10 July. Voorhees wrote, We got to the top at 3 o'clock, but it was so cloudy we could not see the country beyond. We cut our names on a stick and put it in a pyramid of stones that we piled up. The men mistakenly claimed to be the first persons that ever stood on the summit of Pikes Peak. Unaware that Dr. Edwin James and members of Major Stephen Long's expedition had reached the summit, 38 years earlier. Learning from a Mexican that there was a party of white men camped near Soda Springs in the Pikes Peak region, my associate George Howard and Mr. Brott and myself decided we'd go with the Indians as far as the Boiling Springs River, then up to the camp near the Soda Springs. We left Green Russell and his party of Georgians at the mouth of Cherry Creek. Arriving at Soda Springs, we found a party of 40 men and two women from Lawrence, Kansas, who were also searching for gold. We went into camp with the Lawrence party and remained about a month. In the meantime, we sent out two prospecting parties, one under the guidance of a Mexican to go up into the mountains to the headwaters of the Arkansas River, and the other go to South Park by the way of Ute Pass. The party that went to the headwaters of the Arkansas were gone about 15 days and returned with only a sample of iron pyrites, while the party that started to prospect in South Park lost their way and came out of the mountains by the South Platte Canyon. T.C. Dixon Three weeks after Cobb, Miller, and Voorhees reached the summit of Pikes Peak, John D. Miller, hoping a second climb would obtain better views with a clear sky, along with George Peck, James H. Holmes, and Mrs. Holmes, dressed in bloomer costume, started a second ascent of the peak. August 1st 
After an early breakfast this morning, my husband and I adjusted our packs and started for the ascent of Pike's Peak. A walk of a mile brought us to the crossing of Boiling Spring River. It is an impetuous, ice-cold stream at this point, about 12 feet wide, knee-deep, with a cobblestone bottom. Undressing our feet, we attempted it several times before we could cross. The water was so intensely cold, we were ready to drop down with pain on reaching the opposite bank. Three miles further, we reached the wonderful boiling springs which Fremont has made known to the world. There are but three which we noticed. The strong carbonated waters mingling with bubbles of carbonic gas boil continually in the rocky fountains within which they are set by nature better than they could be by art. In the center of broad solid rocks somewhat elevated above the ground around them composed by the deposition of their own waters these springs ceaselessly boil. We speculated on the limestone cave which may somewhere exist above the springs in the heart of the mountains, since they are constantly bringing away limestone in solution. We drank deeply from these Saratogas of the wilderness, and leaving them in another mile, we were vigorously attacking the mountain. Two days of very hard climbing has brought me here. If you could only know how hard, you would be surprised that I've been able to accomplish it. My strength and capacity for enduring fatigue have been very much increased by constant exercise in the open air since leaving home, or I never could have succeeded in climbing the rugged sides of this mountain. This is the most romantic of places. Think of the huge rocks projecting out in all imaginable shapes, with the beautiful evergreens, the pines, the firs, and spruces interspersed among them. Then think of the fragrant little flowers, so many different kinds. There is one little blue flower here, which for some reason I cannot tell exactly what, whether it is the form, color, or fragrance, but it has had the effect to carry me back in imagination to the days of my childhood in my far down eastern home. I have accomplished the task which I have marked out for myself, and now I feel amply repaid for all my toil and fatigue. Nearly everyone tried to discourage me from attempting it, but I believed I should succeed, and now here I am, and I feel that I would not have missed this glorious sight for anything at all. In all probability, I am the first woman who has ever stood upon the summit of this mountain and gazed upon this wondrous scene, which my eyes now behold, How I sigh for the poet's power of description so that I might give you some faint idea of the grandeur and beauty of this scene. Rugged rocks all around and the almost endless succession of mountains and rocks below, the broad blue sky overhead and seemingly so very near, all and everything on which the eye can rest, fills the mind with infinitude, and sends the soul to God. Julia Archibald Holmes A decision was made to leave the Pikes Peak region and head toward Fort Garland in New Mexico to replenish supplies. Three wagons branched off at the Arkansas River and retraced their trail to the States. The remainder of the Lawrence party, in company with three gold seekers from the Green Russell party, made their way toward the Spanish peaks and over the Sangre de Cristo Pass. Arriving within about 12 miles of Fort Garland, we camped on a stream called Placer Creek, where we discovered evidence, as we thought, of mining and having been done at some remote period. We found old wooden washbowls, a broken pick and shovel, and what took to be an old prospect holes. Some of our boys got busy at once with picks, shovels, and pans, and sure enough, in a little while, came into camp with very perceptible colors of gold, 
and some larger flakes in their pans. This was our first discovery of even a color since arriving at the mountains. Next day, a mounted courier on his way to the fort came into our camp and reported that he had come from the Georgia party on the Platte River near the mountains and that the Georgians had struck $5 diggings there. The man seemed to be honest. He gave such details and particulars that convinced us of his story was true. This news had the effect of determining our party to return at once to the Platte. We drove on to the fort and did what little trading we could in great haste and struck back to the trail where our tracks were yet fresh in the road. Jason T. Yonker It was now mid-August. Another wagon separated from the party. This time it was James H. Holmes, wife Julia, and brother Albert Archibald. Traveling south from Fort Garland by way of San Luis, they arrived in Taos on September 8. We arrived at where Cherry Creek meets the Platte on the 6th September, making the trip from Fort Garland, a distance of 225 miles, crossing the Sangre de Cristo Range en route in just eight days. We called that going some for an ox train, though this phrase had not yet been coined at the time. We found some of the Georgians and a few stragglers from Fort Laramie and Salt Lake scattered along the streams and dry creeks prospecting. Some were panning and rocking where they found a rich spot, but such spots were generally quite scarce. Between the mouth of Cherry Creek and Big Dry Creek in the bars and banks of the Platte on the east side, we found colors almost any place, and after a little experience, could find spots near bedrock where we could obtain 10 to 25 cents per pan. Jason T. Yonker. The season wore on. By late September, the remaining members of the party decided it would be a good idea to locate a town site somewhere in the valley. The Lawrence party had in company a surveyor, William Hartley, who had long survey instruments. The first site selected about five miles from the mouth of Cherry Creek on the east bank of the Platte. This town was named Montana City, but it was decided the location was too far from the main trail traveling from Fort Union and Taos north to Fort Laramie, crossing the Platte at Cherry Creek. John Easter and Ross Hutchins moved down to Cherry Creek and founded the town of Auraria, land of gold. Others in the Lawrence party, including Adna French, Frank Cobb, John S. Smith founded a town on the east side of Cherry Creek at the Platte, calling it St. Charles, later renamed Denver in honor of James H. Denver, then governor of Kansas Territory. On 8 August 1859, another group of citizens assembled in Denver to form the Colorado City Town Company. Members included... Richard E. Whitsitt, James L. Winchester, Charles Blake, Seymour W. Wagner, Louis Tappan, Rufus Cable, Charles Persall, Anthony Bott, George A. Butte, Thomas Warren, Jeff Sears, and M.S. Beach. Cable and Beach were selected to go and stake Colorado City at the foot of Pikes Peak. A beautiful sight, Mr. Cable. Have you ever seen such magnificent sculpture of fanciful landscape, Mr. Beach? I have not. There's nothing like it in Kansas. It's no wonder the native peoples have made this their home. Well, we sure haven't seen much sign of them around here. Oh, well, they're around. They're just not stupid. They're up in the mountains where it's cooler instead of down here where it's so damnation hot. Perhaps. Perhaps, Mr. Beach. But I'd certainly choose this a place to live over that dusty, barren camp down by Cherry Creek that Larimer's promoting. I say if gold's found, I'll settle right here in our very own Colorado City. Well, this will be a place many people will want to see with their own eyes when this land is settled. Why, I imagine they'll want to come in here by the thousands. Most assuredly, Mr. Beach. I would choose to live as close as I can to these magnificent rock formations. Why, this would be a capital place for a beer garden when this country grows. Beer garden? This is a place fit for the gods to assemble. We will call it Garden of the Gods. That we shall, Rufus. As usual, you've given the best name to this magnificent place. I say we get down and stake it for our own. 